At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. At Staples Business Advantage, we help you select from 2,000 break room products, so you can be sure there's something for everyone. Yum. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. Shares for Beginners. Weekend Watch List. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners Weekend Watch List, where we'll be taking a close look at an individual company, sector or ETF that you may wish to consider for your watch list. It's not a recommendation to buy, but a way for you to learn how experts screen for value. Joining me is Jason McIntosh from Motion Trader, and we're talking about Vista Group International, ASX code VGL. G'day, Jason. Hey, Phil. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming back. Vista Group International Limited engages in the development, sale and support of software solutions to the film industry worldwide. Tell us a bit more about the company, Jason. Yeah, Phil. So Vista Group's one of those one of those stocks that people probably don't know much about. It's you know it's not exactly a household name. It's got a market cap of around five hundred and sixty million. Not in the all ordinary, so that instantly means that for most people it's like almost unknowable. But um, look, whilst people probably aren't familiar with the name, chances are they've had exposure to their products. So what Vista Group does, it's a a software and technology provider to the global cinema industry, and it operates across distribution as well as exhibition, and they're headquartered in New Zealand. And the company's actually a market leader. So they're active across something like, I think it's like 110 countries, and their cinema management software it's got a 38% market share. So this is when you're looking at the bigger end of the cinema cinema scale. So these are cinema businesses with 20 plus screens. And when you take China out, it's global shares, something like 51%. So look, they've got a really big global reach with the stuff they're doing. So, you know, it's interesting. We often don't know these companies exist, but their products are working behind the scenes to provide, you know, a lot of the products and services that we, you know, we enjoy using. I'm always astonished by these small companies that come out of Australia and New Zealand that seem to take on the world. And you'd think that something like this would be coming out of the United States, which is the basically the home of cinema. But, you know, down here and down under, we're um, pretty good at punching above our weight, aren't we? Yeah. And a lot of really interesting tech stuff seems to come out of New Zealand, interestingly enough. And so, yeah, when I see tech and I see it's based in Auckland... They always have a bit of an extra look. And of course, with the local stuff as well, some really interesting, yeah, small and emerging tech players, which are out there. And more often than not, they're outside the all ordinary. So you don't find them in the top 500. So yeah, you've got to have a bit of a means, the method of going and being able to you know, source them in the first place. Cinemas have come a long way since the days of the big film cans being delivered by hand to get movies there. I mean, it's all digital transfer and um, the distribution of the films is basically via digital means these days, isn't it? Yeah, well, look, that's very much right. It's a very different industry to, to what it was in years gone by. So what are the numbers looking like for VGL? Yeah, well, look, COVID was a real disaster for the cinema in- industry as it was for you know things like gyms and, and airlines and cafes. It was one of the hardest hit sectors. And you know, the thing was, you know, cinemas, if they weren't shut down, they were operating at reduced capacity. So, you know, really, really tough period. And there was also a lack of top end content. So all these blockbusters have all been withheld over the last year or so. So even if you could go to the cinema, there probably wasn't anything you particularly wanted to see. Well, this was all evident in their 2020 results. So revenue was off something like, I think it was 61%. They had a net loss of 51 million. So it was all pretty dire stuff. But the latest quarterly update shows that there's really some good signs of a turnaround. So revenue in the June quarter was flat at around 45 million, which is to be expected. But the bright spot was that their recurring revenues rose 13%. So what that suggests to me is they've been really good at retaining their existing customers and also even selling their new products to their existing customers as well. So I think that's a positive. And there was also a $13 million swing in their EBITDA. So EBITDA, one of those technical terms analysts use, stands for earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization, which again, sounds pretty technical. So simplifying that even more, it's kind of a profitability sort of number. So there's a $13 million swing in, in profitability. So they went from a 
a loss to a profit of something around six and a half million dollars. So positive things happening there. And management's also done a really good job at keeping costs down. So ex- expenses were down 27%. And this all has helped management maintain a strong balance sheet. So they've got something like $58 million in cash. And that was at the end of the, I think at the end of the June quarter. And so look, Having a strong balance sheet is really important when an industry is going through a difficult patch. You want your company to come out the other side. So I think Vista is well positioned to do that, to come out the other side, to ride out this storm, and they're ready to get back into action as the global economies really do reopen. People get back into cinemas, blockbusters come out, and then blockbusters are coming back out. Like, you know, the latest James Bond was out recently. I can't tell you how long my boys and I have been waiting for the next Top Gun to come out, but you know, <laughs> we're told it's coming out soon, so we'll get to the cinema then and you know, chip into the cinema recovery. So, yeah, look, I think things are looking better for that industry, and Vista was on a good growth profile prior to COVID. They'd been increasing revenue every year for several years. So I think it's one of those companies which we could really see come back well if uh, we get back to some resemblance of what we you know, consider normal to be like. Mm. So what caught your eye about VGL? Well, it turned up in my momentum scans. Tell us about the momentum scan. What's momentum and what are you looking for? Yeah, so look, so this stock turned up in the momentum scans and it was starting to turn higher after some big, big falls during that COVID period. So what momentum is, momentum is basically the prevailing direction of the share price. And another name for momentum is the trend. Like a trend is essentially the path of least resistance. So a trend doesn't guarantee that you're going to make money, but it can help put the odds in your favour. So Momentum really is a bit of opportunities calling card in a way, and that's because when you look behind the momentum, that's when you can find some of the most interesting stories. And Vista Group is like one of the examples, as well as like these other smaller emerging tech players that we were talking about a moment ago. And this is so particularly true when you look at the small to mid caps where, you know, people just don't know a company exists. So you just look at the top performing stocks each year and one of the things they all have in common is they've all got upward momentum in the share price over the previous year. And it's this momentum that helps them stand out. So I think one way to look at it is like momentum is a bit like a big flashing light with a sign saying, look at me. And you go and have a look and you might say, yeah, that's interesting. I like this company. I would have seen it without that you know, flashing momentum sign. So that's what momentum is. It can be a, a really helpful thing for drawing your attention to these stocks. Having said that, it's not the holy grail. Stocks can quickly lose momentum and you know, reverse course and fall. But that's where risk management comes in. So you know, overall, I think momentum for me, it puts me in the path of some of the best performing stocks at a relatively early stage. And it helped me find these ones like Vista that you know, I'd otherwise miss. And so Vista was saying, look at me? Yeah, yeah. So it started yelling out, um, oh, it was a few months ago now. And we've, then we've had a recent burst of momentum again over the last few months. So it's one of those ones which I didn't know myself until the momentum drew my attention. And so what are the risks from your point of view? Well, look, you've always got market risk and company risk when you come to the stock market. So market risk is that you know, the stock market turns down next year and you know, we have a period of sideways or falling prices. That's the, the cost of admission. You can't play the stock market without taking market risk. Company risk is that you know, management get it wrong. They don't execute their strategies properly. The rebound from you know, this COVID environment doesn't play out. So you know, you've got those two risks. But look, risk is always manageable. So the first part is that when you go into any stock, really, I think you need to have an exit strategy. You've got to have something in mind to say, well, look, if this doesn't work out, what do I do? Where do I get out? And even if it's going well, you still need to have an exit strategy because at some point you need to say, okay, well, this has done really well. Now I need to be able to take my profit. So you've got to have an exit strategy. But then the other thing you need to do is you also spread your risk. So my own portfolio, I'll have up to 80 stocks in my portfolio. So this means that any one stock, the risk is going to be pretty small. So if it doesn't work out, well, there's not really a lot of downside. But if it goes on and doubles or triples in value, well, then it can make a really meaningful contribution to the overall result. So what I do, I'll build a portfolio of stocks like Vista Group. 
and I don't know which one's going to be a big hit and I don't know which one's not going to work out. So, you know, a stock like Vista could do really well, but then maybe it doesn't. Like no one's got a crystal ball in terms of what is going to happen. It's what potentially could happen. It's looking for possibilities. But you know, by having this portfolio of stocks, I'm spreading my risk and I'm increasing the odds of getting several big wins. And look, that's what I want in an investment. I want this sort of asymmetric risk. And what that means is that I want these situations where my downside is relatively small because I've got this exit strategy, but my upside is large. If you know things work out and trends continue on and you can get these big upside moves and you play those sort of odds all day and you're consistent with it, well then you set yourself up to do potentially pretty well over the you know the medium to longer term. Mm. 80 stocks is a lot and you're an experienced trader so presumably you can manage that size. But you know I think the maximum you would recommend really is more like 10 to 20 stocks for individuals to look at without a lot of experience. Yeah, generally speaking, I'll tell people, you know, work towards a portfolio of maybe around 20 stocks because you're still getting the benefit of spreading risk and also giving yourself the potential to increase your odds of getting on several strong trending stocks. So I think 20 is good. The problem people often get into is that they might have a portfolio of, say, you know, one to five stocks. So that means your risk is, is actually quite concentrated. And look, depends who you listen to and what you read. There are some investors who have done really well with really small concentrated portfolios, but they tend to be very good at the fundamental analysis and the trend identifications or whatever they do. But you know, my training has always been about spreading risk and you spread risk better, I think, when you have a more stocks in your portfolio. 20 to 40 is a good mark for most people. I only moved to 80 because I trade predominantly the smaller end of the market. So stocks outside the ASX 300. And I found that the volume in some of these stocks isn't always fantastic, but they often offer a great opportunity. So I thought by doubling my portfolio size, I reduce the amount of capital that goes in. So it's easy to move in and out. So that's why I found it necessary to expand a portfolio. Previously, I was doing 40 stocks, which was working well. But yeah, I just found during the COVID crash, it was harder to get out of some stocks. So pretty much my portfolio got closed out during COVID until the market started to rebound it. And then it started to rebound and I started to rebuild with um, a wider range of stocks just to yeah, reduce that capital investment, to give me more flexibility. And uh, full disclosure, are you an owner of VGL? I don't have VGL at this point. So the way I do things, it's when I've got available capital and a stock triggers a signal, I'll get into it. You can't hold every stock that you're looking at, can you? Nobody can. And this is why I run a newsletter service, because I can't invest in everything. So people sometimes say, well, if you're so clever, why do you tell people what you do through a stock market newsletter? And I tell them that I don't have enough capital to buy every opportunity. And this is one of the ones which just hasn't happened to trigger a signal when I've had one of those spots available. And uh, since it was first signaled roughly, might have been six to eight months ago, it's done quite well. So, you know, it's a shame I didn't have capital available when it first triggered a signal. But you know, I'm in something else which may have done just as well or even better or maybe a bit worse or whatever during that same period. So that's the thing. You can't invest in every opportunity, but it's about being consistent in your approach and that gives you the potential of getting on, you know, on good stocks that run and you know, doing well from your portfolio. Is there anything else worth mentioning in VGL? Yeah, it's always interesting to pay attention to the substantial shareholder and director transaction notices, particularly with these smaller to mid-cap companies. So with Vista, it's been really interesting to see a fund manager by the name of Safiria Asset Management come onto the share register. So Safiria, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, they specialize in small to mid-cap companies. And they've actually got a pretty good track record. And so they reported a 5.4% interest back in February. Then in August, they increased that up to around 6.6%. And then this month, October, they've increased that up to to around just short of 7.7%. So look, fund managers, of course, get things wrong as well. And this doesn't mean that these guys are buying, so it's got to go up. But I do like it when several factors line up. So in the case of Vista, they've got a good recovery story. 
they got positive share price momentum, which drew it to my attention in the first place. And there's a, an active buyer with a, a good track record around these small to mid cap space. So look, I think this is an, an interesting stock to keep an eye on over the next next year or so. And uh, you never know, it could be one of those momentum plays, which really does develop into a meaningful and potentially a significant trend over the next year. Jason McIntosh, thanks very much for joining us again. And um, it's a pleasure speaking with you as always. I feel always good to talk. Look forward to um, coming back and chatting about stocks again soon. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not shares for beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast. At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things, but I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. At Staples Business Advantage, we help you select from 2,000 break room products so you can be sure there's something for everyone. Yum. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.